Boom. And we are live. Salazzo, what is going on? Not too much, man. How you doing? I'm doing amazing. We're, we're joined here by the gourmet caveman himself here to drop some knowledge on us about how to cook. So just excited for this one. Yeah, his, his Twitter space was fire. So we're looking forward to an amazing conversation. So thanks for coming on, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's always fun to talk food. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, and we were talking a little bit before this, you know, something that makes you incredibly unique is you have this, this incredible education and ability to, to cook and you combine that with this low carb carnivore type approach. So we think that there's a bunch of great nuggets that we've personally learned from you that we want to share with the listener. But I think to start, it would be great to just learn a little bit more about, you know, your background. I know you've got a great little Italian American upbringing. You've got a passion for food. We'd love to just hear the full story. Yeah. So yeah, uh, like I said, I grew up in a, in a big Italian family. Um, you know, with that comes a lot of bread and pasta with every meal and, uh, <laughs> It's, yeah, it was a staple growing up. And it's funny, I was actually set to um, study computer science uh, after high school. <laughs> uh, just growing up in a big family of foodies, I just, I couldn't see myself sitting behind a desk all day. So uh, I told my parents, I'm like, hey, I'm going to culinary school. And they were like, are you kidding? Like, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, I went to culinary school uh went to, to the CIA for a few years um spent some time in Colorado spent some time in New York uh trying to just build a skill set um but along with that I was also building um a weight class mm -hmm. just being in the culinary world and just mm -hmm. eating whatever um and it got to the point one day where I'm just looking I'm like man what do I like because I, I grew up doing sports, I, you know, martial arts, hockey, did everything. And I never really stopped that. But all of a sudden, I'm just like, how am I so out of shape, even though I stay active? And I just realized it was what I was eating. And um, so I started to do a lot of research into what, you know, what, what really is a health, how are we designed to eat? Mm -hmm. And um, Initially, it led me down the keto path. So I was doing a lot, you know, high fat, low carb diet. Um, and then, you know, that, that worked right away. I, 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 I got up to the point where I was, I think at my heaviest, I was like 230 pounds, like mm -hmm. something, something serious. And um, started keto, dropped a lot of that right away. Mm -hmm. And then kind of kept it going and eventually evolved into doing carnivore. The more I did carnivore, the more, the better I felt. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, I guess it's a tie in what you're saying about, you know, being coming from a culinary background. Uh, I noticed that there's a lot of, um, of not just simplicity, but almost like there's like a monotone nature to a lot of what uh, is kind of put out there on the carnivore diet. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity to kind of keep variety, keep, uh, keep things interesting, you know, still have fun eating, um, but, but um, still maintain that, that lifestyle. Um, yeah. And uh, I've been kind of sticking with it ever since. I, I'm interested to hear how you applied that tenant to your own journey, because, you know, I think it, when everyone starts off, they just start cooking ribeyes. So what helped you create some of that diversity in food? I guess being exposed to a lot of it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing a lot of like, you know, quote unquote, farm to table stuff um, mm -hmm. back, you know, when I was still doing a lot of, I was in a lot of fine dining restaurants, boutique hotels, things like that. Um, so I guess getting the exposure and, and having that kind of background and experience allowed me to kind of not get stuck in that repetitive nature that I think a lot of carnivore does where it's just, you know, ground beef and eggs, uh, you know, and just, and, or, or, or ribeyes if you can afford it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you know, there's a lot of talk about nose to tail and utilizing the whole animal. And I feel like that for the most part stays in generalities and colloquialisms, but there's really not a whole lot of detail and instruction on how to actually do that and do it in a way where it's approachable to a lot of people. You know, you start 
talking about organ meats and I think a lot of people get turned off right away or freaked out because just this in you know current society there's just not really a whole lot of um, exposure to it so uh, it can it can I think turn people off pretty quickly or um, but you, you apply the right techniques and I, I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity to have a lot of variety in your diet and uh, be able to get a lot of like really good nutritionally dense foods in through organ meats. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then there's also the cost aspect of it. Like I said, mm -hmm. you know, you can afford ribeye, that's great, but um, you know, most people can't buy ribeyes day in and day out and get away with it for too long uh, from a budget standpoint. So yeah, it's also, you know, all the different cuts of the animal and, and they can all be prepared in pretty damn good ways. Uh, and you don't have to pay $18 a pound for it. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And do you have your, do you have, would you say you have a stable of like go-to dishes throughout the week or are you heavy into the variety where you feel like you are mixing it up every single I, day? Yeah. I try to mix it up as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Really kind of whatever I'm in the mood for at the time, but I do try to keep a good rotation of things. Um, like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I, yeah, uh, I came across some cow tongue. And so I was like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, braise this down. I made barbacoa out of it and you wow. know, made tacos for the family. And How was uh, that? Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, right. the funny thing here, a lot of people hear like tongue and it, that's like, they can't get over that, especially yeah. when you see it in its raw form, you're like, how the hell would anyone think to eat that and enjoy it? But once you cook it down and, and you've braised it for a while and you peel the skin, it's you, you shred, it looks like shredded beef, like, like any other uh, cut that you would do, you know, you could, you could, you could take a chuck roast and a, and a tongue and the final form looks almost identical. You can't really tell the difference between the two. Wow. Yeah. I have a buddy that's South African and the first time I met him, I forget it was either bull tongue or beef tongue jerky. I guess that's a big part of their, it's, it's big in their right. tradition over there. And it was so freaking good. It had this like big piece of fat on it. It almost tasted like a ribeye. I don't know if that's a wrong take, but I was like, damn, this thing's sure. so delicious. Did bill tongue? Yeah. yeah. So bill tongue is, yeah, it's like South African jerky. Yes. Uh, and so the difference that you think of like, all right, beef jerky and bill tongue, bill tongue is like the whole cut and it gets sliced after it's mm. been dry. And, um, yeah, you can make biltong out of almost any cut. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. So if they made biltong out of tongue, that's yeah. impressive. That's yeah, pretty I cool. could, it was it was it was freaking delicious, man. He had like a big bag of it, and we were just yeah. we were crushing it. So it was, it was it was awesome. But um, for you, what what's kind of your definition of carnivore? Are you mostly red meat, chicken, eggs, fish, or do you mix in dairy? What's what's your take now? I mean, I, I do I do use dairy. Mm -hmm. Um, I try to keep it, uh, I, I try not to, um, rely on it too much, uh, for fat content and, um, it's, but yeah, I incorporate it all. I'll, you know, I'll have chicken, I'll have fish, I have eggs, uh, butter, all that stuff. You know, I think, I think butter is the heaviest use for me when mm -hmm. it comes to dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also do seafood and shellfish. Um, you know, I, 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 I eat oysters almost all the time because it's just solid bioavailable zinc. Um, so um, there's, yeah, I mean, any and all, I, I, maybe that's a little bit too broad of a definition of, for carnivore, but uh, I, the way I look at it, it's, it's, that's the, you know, the, the broad spectrum of, of like I said, bioavailable food that we've been kind of designed to eat mm. uh, evolutionarily, so. It's, uh, yeah. And, uh, you, you know, one of the things that slots and I, you know, we're cooking for ourselves, but you said you're cooking for your family. Is that something, there's a dynamic there that adds a whole new layer to sort of what we're talking about. And I definitely appreciate sure. that. So like, what, what sort of things are you doing to accommodate for everyone? Well, I guess it's, I mean, my family eats more paleo than carnivore. Yeah. Um, you know, so, um, I mean, that's another thing. I'll eat, I'll eat some vegetables and I'll eat some fruits. That's okay. Um, I don't, I think when, when you start making it this kind of rigid, rigid, almost ideology, then getting away from the point, which is, 
like good food and health. Yeah. And um, I think, uh, so like, I'm, I'm totally okay with having some, you know, leafy greens every now and then, or, mm-hmm. you know, a berries, you know, um, oh, making yeah. a batch of chicken or something like that. Yeah. I'll throw berries in. It's okay. I, I don't see it as an issue. Um, or that I'm like breaking the carnivore code in some way. Same thing, like you put compound butter in, you know what? I'm gonna cook with garlic, I'm gonna cook with thyme, I'm gonna cook with mushrooms and, um, you know, I'll incorporate that stuff into what I what I do. So that way it's, I guess, how I eat is carnivore centric, but not so rigid that I can't have other things with it. I just have those things in moderation, if that makes sense. Um, but as far as my family, um, yeah, like they, I would say they eat, uh, you know, paleo and I, I have two daughters and just, um, we just had our third, a, a boy three months ago. And the funny thing is, is that, um, my wife could tell, or had a feeling it was a boy because with our first two, you know, she wanted, you know, fruits and sweeter stuff. And, uh, with him, her, cra- her cravings were at steak. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fermented food like i made the amount of like steak and eggs and kimchi that i made for my wife during the pregnancy was out of control she was eating like sauerkraut like right out of the right out of the jar so it was um yeah a whole different dynamic but um we might need to do some studies on that what's that we might need to do some studies on that yeah right um but yeah so i'll make you know uh like i'll make some sweet potatoes for them uh Mm -hmm. one of my wife's favorite things to have with a steak is uh, cauliflower mash. Mm. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take a couple heads of cauliflower, I'll slice them real thin, and I'll throw them in a pot with either some tallow or compound butter or, um, or, or even clarified butter, and just let it cook down real slow, like I'm, cook- like I'm caramelizing onions. Mm. So the, the cauliflower will start to get soft, and it will start to caramelize and get that like golden brown color all throughout. And it just kind of like turns to mush. Mm. Um, and I'll warm up some cream with a uh, clove of garlic or two and a sprig of thyme and kind of use that as an aromatic and just whip that into the, into the mm. cauliflower as it turns to mush. And it's basically mashed potatoes, but cauliflower. So it's, so good. It, it fits right into the, the, you know, the concept of, paleo or carnivore or whatever you want to call it um i guess the, the dairy doesn't but uh, mm. i would say it's close enough but so you can have like a good steak and you know mashed quote-unquote potatoes um but still have it be kind of health oriented mm. that's great and that's that's something clemenza and i talk a lot about too especially in the carnivore community people get so dogmatic and they act like yeah. about this stuff to your point where we're similar to you where it's like we call it we have been carnivore and it's amazing as a removal diet, but we're now really animal based. So like we'll have berries, we'll do the raw dairy, we'll do the cream. And you know, there's, for me, I have ulcerative colitis. So like dark leafy greens, I struggle with those, but like right. I still, we'll, I'll find other vegetables like a sweet potato or something like that or, or work those in. Yeah. And in my, in, in my opinion, there's nothing wrong with eating that way. It's like, if, if that, if your diet becomes centered around the other stuff, then you might run into some issues. But uh, like you said, if it's animal based and that's kind of the, the central focus and all of your other stuff kind of gets built around it, I don't particularly see any issue with that, you know? So it yeah. might be a rid of what the, you know, the diet is considered, but I think it's, it's, it's applicable no matter, mm-hmm. you know, look at it. Have you, um, especially with you having those Italian roots and like going back home for the holidays and stuff, I, I'm sure, have you found any just good, like low carb variations to, to, to those dishes? Like, will you incorporate gluten-free pasta or you kind of have like meatballs and red sauce? Like, what do you, what do you think about that? So yeah, like I, when I make pasta for the kids, it's gluten-free pasta that I'm making. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, um, you know, before I really switched that, uh, this stuff over, my oldest daughter is six and um, my, my, my two daughters growing up before I really kind of made this transition over, they both uh, from like a really young age, like three months, just had like terrible eczema. Mm. And the moment we made this transition over, that eczema started to kind of dissipate and since then has been gone. 
And I really believe that, and I could be wrong. This is completely anecdotal and just kind of my observation, you know, um, but I really believe that the uh, removal of the sheer volume of gluten that they were eating at the time, um, uh, I think played a big part, you know, it's, it, like I said, it just kind of dissipated the moment we started making that dietary change uh, mm -hmm. for them. You know, it's funny, my, my middle daughter, um, her favorite food in the world is steak now. Like, I'll make, I'll make them dinner and then I'll make a steak for myself and she'll come by for second dinner and she'll just be like, you making steak? I'm like, yeah, like Mahasa. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll have a plate of steak. So, um, so yeah, they've really, they've really kind of ad adapted to it well. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been good so far. That's amazing. What, what, um, what sort of things will you try to do for snacks or, or things that are healthy alternatives to a sit down meal? Cause I, I think that that's kind of the hardest part of the lifestyle transition is you usually have to be around your own kitchen to make it work a hundred percent of the time. So is there anything that you like to do, whether, I, I mean, I buy pork rinds, that's like kind of something that I've, that's like my emergency, like, Hey, I'm, I'm hungry at, and I'm on the run for, you know, 24 hours, just pack those and I'll be good. But anything that you, that comes to mind for you? No, I do pork rinds too. Uh, we keep them in the house. The kids really like them. Um, good substitute for like potato chips. If you need a snack real quick. Um, another thing is, I mean, making your own jerky is, you know, it can be, you know, you like, you have to almost make a day of it, but if you do, you know, if, if you invest in getting a decent size dehydrator, you can make a big batch and kind of package them up and, you know, use those as like go-to snacks. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've made big batches of pemmican. So that way I have like little pemmican bars, you know, if you want to have that, um, it, it requires a little bit of effort, but uh, I feel like the payoff is pretty big, um, you know, and, and for me personally, um, right alongside with all of these dietary changes is uh, I went the intermittent fasting route. So uh, mm. if I don't have something good at, on hand, then I'll just wait until I do, you know, I'm, I, I'd rather wait and have something good later than, you know, uh, a compromise and have something I really shouldn't now just because I'm, you know, giving into, you know, these kind of like, I almost, they're almost like flights of fancy. Like you just kind of like you're in, you're in the mood for something. And you're just like, it's like, I guess it requires a certain level of, of discipline. And then, you know, I'm not claiming that I'm, you know, I'm perfect that I always, you know, like I'm you know, disciplined all the time or anything like that. But, um, it's just a, I guess it's a, it's an approach I try to stick to as much as possible. Um, so I think it's the best part about the, the diet. But, I was going to say, I feel like it's, a, sorry to cut you off, but I, I think it's part of like the best part about the lifestyle is that when you get into that satiated fat, fat burning zone, you really kind of have the flexibility to say no to a meal and be fine. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, the more I've done it, the easier it gets. That's for sure. Um, kind of like establish the habit and the routine. It's, it's not too hard. Um, and I think uh, some of that too is, you know what, on the occasion, yeah, have a cheat meal. Uh, it's, it's okay. You know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna destroy all your progress in, in, in one meal. Now, if you're saying to yourself, like you're having a cheat meal and you're like, oh, I'm going to have a cookie and then that turns into like one every other day, then that's a whole different story. But, you know, right. I think being able to on occasion you know indulge it's it's mm -hmm. it's okay as long as you still have that discipline afterwards you know so it's not like i'm gonna not have you know uh a bite of cake on my kid's birthday or something like yeah. that right i think it goes back to the dogma thing that we were talking about but um it i do think that once you've established the habit and the lifestyle it's easy to keep that and it's easy also then put into perspective the other stuff where it's like you know you don't even treat it as food it's like this mm. thing that you have and you partake and you're all right great whatever and then you, you know it doesn't become something that you crave or that you want all the time it's one of those things it's like yeah i can have a bite of that and then i'm pretty much done so 
Right. Yeah, like yeah. a bite of cheesecake as opposed to like two or three pieces or something like that. Exactly. Uh, have you also noticed too, since going down the low carb rabbit hole, that your body is now more sensitive when you reintroduce those foods that might be higher in gluten or sugar? Yes, 100%. I've definitely become a lightweight when it comes to that stuff. If I have a bite of pasta, I, I can all within five minutes, I can feel it just kind of sitting in my stomach and it just, it's, uh, I, yeah, I definitely have become more, more sensitive to it. Um, I don't know if that's like, if that's always the case, but I, for me personally, yeah, I've definitely become sensitive to, uh, that stuff. And that's why I think that's why it's easier to stick to. And those, those, those cheats and indulgences become f like fewer and far between because, um, you know, you can feel the effect of it mm -hmm. after you kind of stuck to it for a while. And like you were saying, when we start, you know, when I started it, it was, it was strictly carnivore. Mm -hmm. So if you're using it as a, um, you know, uh, uh, what's the term you, know, you get rid of everything else. Uh, eliminate. Eliminate. Yeah. Eliminate. Um, you start out that way and I feel like it, it gives your body a chance to reset. And, um, you know, once that's happened, it's a lot easier to maintain that because you don't, you know, if you have, uh, like you said, a bite of cheesecake, you're not saying to yourself, oh man, I want 10 more bites of that. Yes. Say, oh, wow. That's so decadent. That's like one bite is enough. Yep. One, one thing I've, I've, no, uh, I've, I've really, and I, 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 I haven't drank soda even well before I um, started the, my whole weight loss thing. I just, I was never really a soda person, but uh, it, it, I, I, I still can't wrap my head around how people can drink that stuff in the sheer volumes that people drink with it. It's, it's like you're drinking syrup with bubbles in it. And it's, I'm like, I can't, I can't wrap my head around it anymore. It's, it's crazy. Um, yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Before before I started going down this rabbit hole, like my whole family just drank Diet Coke for whatever reason. So I just grew up, grew up drinking it, and I've noticed that like every once in a while I'll I'll have one of those Zevias, which is sweet. It's like a it's like carbonated soda, but it's sweet and just with a stevia leaf. And like you know, it's probably not the best thing for you. It's kind of like a seltzer. And every yeah. once in a while I'll have it if I'm really jonesing for something. But you start to rewire rewire your palate where like just seltzer or water with lemon or something like that. That's like oh, yeah. with your meal. Oh yeah. We, we, we go through a fair amount of seltzer in this house, you know, yeah. that's more than enough. Uh, um, as far as, you know, a variety of drink, um, me, that and just, you know, just plain water is fine too. And then yeah. I, I, I am guilty of drinking a lot of black coffee. That's, that's my, my late coffee. at night too. Oh yeah. All, <laughs> Couple hours, hours of the day. I'm, I'm that person. I can, I can have a big cup of coffee and uh, fall asleep 15 minutes later. It's not a big deal for me. Yeah, I'd see Italian. Yeah, yeah. 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 I remember being six, and my grandmother would be like handing us espresso after dinner. And like little kids just getting a, like a really, really super bitter super heavy shot of espresso and it's like yeah, that's what you drink it's incredible <laughs> um one of the things we wanted to ask you and this is really important for people that are interested in going towards this you know animal animal based low carb approach what do you think are just some basic skills around cooking meat that just everyone should know how to do so i think i guess starting with some kind of um, basic knowledge of, of the different cuts or, or at least some meat ID, um, meaning what, what type of cuts do I really need to braise or slow cook? What type of cuts can I get away with grilling? Um, which is actually a, a wider range than you think it is sometimes. Hmm. Um, I mentioned chuck roast earlier. Um, that's, I, I view chuck roast as like poor man's ribeye. Hmm. Um, when people think of chuck roast, they're thinking of, you know, pot roast and slow cooking and, and you know, um, but I, I treat chuck roast like a steak, like a ribeye, you know, um, really? and it, to me, it turns out perfect every time. Will you uh, grill it? You'll grill it? I'll reverse sear it. I'll grill it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think as far as talking about like 
basic techniques when it comes to grilling or, or grillable steaks, any of those high dry heat um, applications. Um, I, I'd have to say the, the, the one method of cooking that you really want to learn is the reverse here. Mm -hmm. um, for two reasons. One is, uh, in my opinion, it tenderizes it a little bit better than just throwing, slapping it on a grill. Um, but also it gives you so much better control over the doneness of the meat, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're dealing with thicker cuts. Uh, if you have a really, really thin steak, then just pan sear it and be done with it. Um, but if you have anything that's like an inch plus, I, 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 I like to go with the reverse sear. Um, and what that entails is basically in, in its simplest form and most approachable form, you set your oven to about 225 degrees. Um, you pull out whatever steak that you're about to do, uh, pull it out well in advance. Uh, you want to let that steak get to like room temperature all throughout and nothing bad is going to happen to it if it sits out on the counter for a couple of hours. Uh, especially if you pat it dry, you don't want to kind of sit in juices. Uh, but yeah, so you start out, pull it out, pat it dry. Uh, I season it right then and there um, because I want to let the salt in particular uh, really work its way throughout the meat. That's also going to help tenderize it a little bit, but by, by osmosis, it's going to, you know, the salt and the, and the moisture and the meat are going to find equilibrium over time. So that salt will start to melt essentially into the meat. Mm -hmm. uh, so you just get better seasoning all around. And while you're waiting for it to hit room temp, it's just kind of doing its thing anyway. So Ideally, what you want to do is put those steaks on a, or the steak that you're cooking on a rack in the oven. And that's so you get airflow all around it. If you just put it on a pan, that bottom of the steak is just kind of going to sit in its juice. Um, but get it on a rack, throw it in the oven, two, 225 ish, 250, you can go. There's really this wiggle room there. Um, especially if you, you know, most ovens at home, uh, when you set it to 250, that's actually an average temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, what are, do is it'll because most ovens at home only know on and off that's it so it's either applying heat or turning off mm -hmm. so what it'll do is it'll heat up until its internal thermometer reads like 300 and then it'll turn off and then drop down to 200 then it'll kick back on so you're getting an average of heat um so setting it to you know 225 exactly or whatever is really it's it's not going to make or break it whether you do 225 or 250. Okay. Do you let that in the oven um, and basically let it cook until the center of the steak reaches about 115, 120 if you want to go for medium rare. And then you could pull right from the oven into a hot pan to sear. So hence the reverse sear. Um, so you want to get, you know, while that's finishing up, you get your pan hot you get your oil in there whatever it is and by oil i mean you know i stick to tallow clarified butter things that can handle uh high heat mm -hmm. uh so you don't want to put whole butter in a pan uh because whole butter is also comprised of water and and milk proteins mm -hmm. so the can burn if your pan's too hot the water in the butter is going to separate and then start then basically turn to steam so you get all that spatter um so clarified butter is just the fat um, so you go with that or tallow, good high smoke point heat, um, high smoke point oils. And then you're just searing it for a couple of minutes because mm -hmm. the doneness is already there. All you want to do is develop a crust um, on, on the surface of the steak. So you're talking about a minute each side, maybe, um, you know, you, you do, do a minute each side, then maybe do another minute each side just to get a good crust and, and then you pull it off and it's ready to roll. Um, mm -hmm. And you do that with a chuck roast. And it's, it's delicious, especially once you slice it up. Uh, it, to me, it looks and tastes like a ribeye at half the cost. Wow. So, I mean, dude, that's I, a game changer, honestly, because to your point, I've always been taught that chuck roast is just something you slow cook or put into a Dutch oven. I didn't realize that you could, you could reverse sear it and basically have it come out like a ribeye. Because what's it, a grass fed chuck roast is like six, seven bucks tops, maybe. So that's right. a deal. Right. I mean, you, and you compare it to what, if you get a grass fed ribeye, I mean, you're paying triple. Literally. So yeah. It's, it's worth it. 
Um, especially if you do that method where you're, you're, you're seasoning it ahead of time, you're letting it come to room temp, you're, you're, you're going to get it at, a, at its most tender and at its most even doneness. Um, and don't overcook them, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, with, a, with a chuck roast. Yeah, it'll probably get a little chewy if you're trying to go for medium well. Yeah. Uh, you know, as, I think as you eat more red meat, you kind of get more of a taste for that medium rare at most uh, mm -hmm. type of done. So when you stick to that, yeah, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, it's not overtly chewy. And uh, it's another thing too, I, I, it's, I, I wonder where this obsession with like tenderness has come from, mm -hmm. again, almost societally where everyone like you know touts the the the, the tenderloin and it's like to me it's like it's like meat mush sometimes it's like tenderloin is one of the most expensive cuts and for me it's like way down on the totem pole of like what i would choose if i could have my pick of any cut in the world yeah. uh, so maybe i'm just weird like that but i don't equate tenderness with a better steak necessarily yeah so what would be that it, chuck roast and it's tender and, it, and it's sliced well, is the, is the chuck roast your cut of choice as far as like cheap accessible go-to's yeah because it's it's got a really good uh fat to protein ratio very similar to a ribeye in that sense so uh you don't need to add much to it so you're not going just like protein and no fat um so to me, it's that's it's got a good ratio as that on that front, and like I said, it's cheap and accessible, and you can treat it like a steak, and it comes out fantastic, in my opinion. Love it. Yeah. So that's I would say that's the most common steak I'm using in the house, uh, at home is is a chuck roast, because it's just it's quick and easy, and um, yeah, it's not breaking my budget. Yeah. Do you do a lot of chicken as well? Or mostly red meat? Not much. That's yeah. probably the most infrequent thing I'm making at home. Um, just because it's, unless you're raising your own, it's hard to get good quality chicken, in mm -hmm. my opinion. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so much, there's so much corn and soy in the feed that you're going to get from like commercial chicken that it's like, you know, the, the omega-6 and omega-3 ratio is like so out of balance that it's, and that it just has no flavor either, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, unless you're getting real good local, uh, well-fed chicken, uh, it's almost not worth it sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's dirt cheap at the store, but you get what you pay for on that front. Yeah. I'm just getting loaded with pupas and omega six and everything. And, um, yeah, Harris, Harris Clemenza and I will sometimes get it from just right from a local farm. And I, I do like those, those baked chicken thighs with like some hot honey on it, but that's pretty much like, if I am going to eat chicken, that's pretty much all I'm going to eat. Besides that, it's pretty much just like straight red meat, whether it's, you know, beef or bison or something like that. It's the flavor is so good, the nutrients, all that stuff. Yeah. That's funny. Usually when I'm doing chicken at home now, it's that's the thing. It's like, I have to, I feel like I, I almost over season it just mm. to give it up, you know, um, like I'll, uh, I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll spatchcock a chicken and rub like salt and harissa and something spicy, you know, just like spices and spicy stuff under the skin mm. and, uh, and, and cook it off in the cast iron finish in the oven. So just like, uh, one thing I do like is like real crispy chicken skin. Mm. That's mm. Thing. it's, it's a, it's one of those guilty pleasures where yeah. it's just, um, it's but, so good. but, um, again, it's just, it's not, it's not a go-to for me, but, uh, but it, it's, you know, it's in the rotation at home every now and then you mix it in with your, yeah. chuck, with your chuck or your steak. I know you mentioned the dry brining with the salt. Is there any other seasoning you like, or do you like to just keep it very simple with like salt or pepper or something like that? It, it depends what I'm making at the time. Like, yeah, you can do very simple salt and pepper. Um, it depends on what I'm making with it. You know, um, I'll add other seasonings and spices to, to the dry rub, um, the dry cure. What, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's really, that is like sky's the limit, whatever you want to do with it. You know? Um, 
if um, this, what was I making not too long ago? I did um, I did a grilled heart actually, mm. and heart is it's another muscle meat in my opinion. So you can treat it just like steak. So, um, but I did it like I uh, I did it with some uh, guacamole and I made like a sour cream sauce with it. So I was just kind of mm. going like style and so yeah, I took you know some. Uh, ground up chipotle and rub that in and uh squeeze lime over it you know so there's, there's a million different and that's that's just one example there's you know endless different things that you can do with it depending on what you're serving with it um you know i uh i've done a, i've done a steak where i've rubbed a, a garam masala uh mm. and uh ground cardamom on it and uh, made like uh almost like a tikka masala sauce yeah. and just that's, and that was just the sauce and you just put it right on the steak and it, it's, it's good as is. Have you ever done the coffee rub? Yes, you, I, I, I'm good. I, I like coffee rubs, but it has to be a really fine espresso grind. Mm. Uh, I see some people do coffee rubs and they're using like regular ground coffee and you're just begging for like crap to be in your teeth for like the rest of the evening because... <laughs> You get like like gritty, you know, bits that are left over in the in, in the rub. So, um, if you're gonna go with a coffee rub, either use instant coffee mm. uh, as part of the rub, or like a really really fine espresso grind. Got it. Gotcha. Got it. What would um, so if someone's starting from scratch in terms of building out a kitchen, what would you tell them in terms of the top three things to buy to just the basics for, you know, filling out a kitchen? Um, I mean, I would say just get a decent set of pots and pans. Um, you can do a lot with, I mean, uh, my house here is an electric stove. It's not some, it's not outlandish. Um, and a good cast iron, like cast mm -hmm. iron goes a long way when you just, all you have is a stove. Um, so really basic simple stuff is 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 that i mean there's there's a lot of things you can do indoors with uh just a any type of stove and a good cast iron that you, that you maintain um outside uh, i mean there are charcoal grills are cheap mm -hmm. and it's worth the effort to um you know get some good hardwood lump um or just if you if i mean if you live in a wooded area just get just get some twigs and sticks and make a fire mm -hmm. um that that whatever you grill over that is going to taste infinitely better than what you're trying to grill over propane um oh, yeah. so it's 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 worth to me it's worth the effort and that's like uh, you know and, and there's something like primally satisfying with cooking over a anyway and not just kind of like hearing the click of the gas turn on so um yeah, anything you do, anything you do. I mean, some of the best, some of the best food that I've ever had is like, you know, the garbage food when you're like, you know, you, you're a Cub Scout and on your first camping trip, and you're eating food that was cooked right on a fire, and it's like out of one of those like little tin pots, and it's oh. like, there's like from a from a culinary standpoint, there's no value there, but that stuff is just so like. There's, I don't know. There's something like deep within you that stirs when you when you eat that, eat that way that sticks with you. So I, I, any chance you get to emulate that, I think is a is a good thing. Yeah, I know. There's that one chef, Francis Mal Malman, out of Patagonia, and he does all that cooking over the open fire, and it just looks, yeah. just gets that that crust on it. It looks unbelievable. Yes, him and uh, there's another guy in Australia is. Um, Lennox Hasty. Yeah, with Fire Door, right? It's on that's on that, that, that's insane. Awesome concept. I love it. It's it's such a cool, it's such a cool thing. And I mean, I mean, it was he was on uh, on the Netflix show. Uh, yeah, Chef's Table. He was on Chef's Table. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it has impact. It's like that's you know, I think those are that type of that type of food and that type of philosophy for cooking i think has more resonance with me than anything you find in the you know the 
the Alinea uh, type of, if you're familiar with um, the yeah. restaurant in Chicago, the molecular gastronomy stuff and trying to, you know, like all that like avant-garde out there stuff. It's really cool, but I don't think anyone is going to be eating there three times a week as like their staple food. Right. Just, it, it, you know, in uh, the height of that molecular gastronomy thing was, uh, you know, out of New York was uh, Wiley Dufresne, WD-50. And it was, it was, you know, again, it was really, really cool stuff that they were doing really, you know, wild shit. But it was, a, you know, at the end of the day, and this is just my opinion, I'm not, you know, not to take away anything from what they're doing. They're incredibly talented, way more talented than me. That's, that's for sure. But I can't help but get the feeling that those are almost like parlor tricks mm. where it doesn't feel like food to me. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's, you know, it's, it's that, that avant-garde art, but it's, I, I, it, it doesn't satisfy that, that, you know, the, like I said, that, that primal food instinct. Yeah. It, and it's funny you say that too, because I remember that was one of the things that Lennox brought up in that chef's table restaurant is that he's classically trained and he's in these two, three Michelin star French restaurants and he's seeing all the preparation and all the work that's going into it. And he's saying to himself, I don't even really like the way that this tastes. And then he, I think he quit, he quit and went overseas to Spain and was like wandering yep. and found that dude that was cooking over an open fire and just became obsessed with it. Similar to the yep. way that you're talking about it. Yeah. And, and uh, I think <clears throat> there's something to be said for that, that like, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot of interesting techniques out there and there's a lot of wild complexity to food that a lot of chefs are doing. But for me personally, at least it just doesn't really speak to me. And I, you know, mm. I've, I've, I've been in that environment where like the competitive nature between chefs is to like outdo one another. And it's like, always push the envelope, push the envelope. What can you do more? What can you do more? Mm. And I, you know, maybe it's a combination of just, maybe I wasn't, I just didn't have the talent for that. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I think I can cook decently, but I, you know, but it also didn't really, it didn't really kind of speak to me in, in any meaningful way. Whereas cooking over a fire, I, I, I mean, I could do that for the rest of my life and it would make me happy. Same here. Amen. Hey, I, I'm curious in your culinary training, was there a lot of discussions around nutrition or like the use of seed oils? No, uh, I'm willing to bet you can go to most Michelin restaurants and they still use seed oils in one way or another. Maybe not as much anymore, I think, with the kind of rise in popularity uh, or, or rise in awareness of what seed oils are all about. Mm -hmm. But definitely think at least when i was kind of coming up and you know even in culinary school and things like that people didn't regard canola oil as an unhealthy thing mm. things you know so there is an orthodoxy there that i think is hard to break um even amongst the you know the upper echelons of of uh of the food world so um you know and it's, it's funny even in my most recent job i you know i i working at a hospital and working with dietitians and a lot of dietitians adhere to that academia that or academic or orthodoxy from a, from a dietetic and nutrition standpoint. And there's not a whole lot of people out there saying what seed oils do and mm. what they're all about and what they do to you. And there's, you know, uh, I think, um, it's almost like, from a nutrition standpoint, that's still on the cutting edge, if that makes sense. Mm. Absolutely. And that's where what you're talking about is so important is just being able to teach people to make these simple, flavorful, delicious things at home. So they can honestly, like, I feel like I'm at a point now where I'm avoiding going out to a lot of restaurants. I'm like, I love yeah. the dining experience, but now like once you go, once you get seed oil pilled, you'll sit there at the dinner table. <laughs> seed pills, yeah. I like oil pill you're like you're like fuck i know that this has vegetable oil in it do i eat it do i not eat it like i try and i sometimes i guilt myself and sometimes you want to just have the delicious food but it's so it's so tough to avoid it contaminates everything at a restaurant yeah it's everywhere it's really it's really hard to avoid uh, seed oils and soy it's mm -hmm. in every that's processed it's in everything that you'll find at like 
you know, the local restaurants, because it's also, it's, it's, it's what restaurants can afford. It's, you know, it's cheap. It's, it's, I mean, it's such a heavily subsidized product that, um, you know, a lot of restaurants and the thing is that in the restaurant world, especially, you know, uh, small individual restaurants, profit margins are so slim mm. that really it's, it's hard to, it's hard to justify uh, not using that stuff from a, you know, survival standpoint as a business. So I totally understand why it's used. Um, but I do think that the more people know and understand what real food is, I think the culture over time will start to shift and change, but I don't know if we're ever going to get rid of that stuff entirely. Um, just because it's, it's so heavily pushed and it's in everything you find, uh, nowadays. And, uh, but you know, Hey, listen, with, uh, the current state, bears in the world uh who knows maybe that stuff might uh, fall by the wayside and say yeah exactly i know one of the other things i we were we were talking about you dry brining um and reverse searing the chuck are there any other like just basic really good meat prep skills that you think people should should just know how to do in the kitchen i mean if if you're slicing meats you definitely want to uh know where the grain of the meat is and slice against that. Um, that's going to the, you know, the whole sticking with the grilling thing. Mm -hmm. um, for other like methods of cooking for the things that don't really do well on a grill or on a reverse here, it's really just learning how to, how to braise meats. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you can take that same chuck roast and, and turn it into a really good braise if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, one cheap cut nowadays is beef shin. It's basically also buco, but beef form. Uh, get a little marrow in there too. It's 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 delicious, but it requires a long, slow cook. Um, so I think, and, and I'm a, a you know I guess I'm a more of a traditionalist. You know the advent of the instant pot. And everyone's got an instant pot that they can throw around, but uh, I still like to to cook low and slow in the oven. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean that comes with uh, so you want to reverse sear a steak, you want to sear and then braise um, mm. any of those cuts. So if, like if you're taking a beef shin, for example, uh, you want to do the same thing that you're doing with, with any other steak is you want to bring it out, let it hang out, season it, let it sit in, its, in the seasoning for a while, uh, but then sear it right off the bat. You want to develop some flavor. Um, and uh, you know, like I have my, uh, my, uh, hand me down from my grandmother Le Crusette pot that uh, I use for all of my, all of my braising. And uh, yeah, sear it. Um, all those like brown bits that form on the bottom of the pot, mm. the old French culinary term is that it's called a fond. Mm. And the, the concept of deglazing. So you sear it, you get, you kind of get, you get a good sear on, on the meat itself. But then at the bottom of that pot, you want to basically pull up all of that stuff and incorporate it into the liquid and it's going to fortify the liquid, the braising liquid and, and its flavor and its complexity. Um, and you can deglaze with any liquid technically. Um, acid pulls up that fond better than anything else, but you can, you can even just pour water on it and it would still pull that stuff up from the pot. Um, but that's where, you know, you can throw a wine in, you can throw spirits in and then uh, having a good uh, uh, a good beef stock uh, or bone broth or something like that to finish to to finish out that that liquid, and then you throw an aromatics in. You can you can even um, uh, before you deglaze, you can throw you know if you have root veg, if you have some onions, you, any of that stuff. It's just you're trying to build you're trying to layer flavors into that uh, mm -hmm. break to have a good deep complex flavor in there. Um, and it's simple, like I said, you know, the straight carrots, onion, celery is, is a classic go-to for things to just build out a flavor. It's the, that's your traditional quote unquote mirepoix. Um, and you can cook that down and, and get a good, you know, even build on the fond from there, deglaze some red wine, some bourbon, depending on what you want to, you know, what, what your application is. Um, and you build that liquid and then you return the, the meat to that liquid. And the key is not to have too much liquid. So you don't want it basically simmering or boiling. Um, you wanna have enough liquid where whatever 
cut of meat that you want to braise, it's you know no more than two thirds of the way up. The liquid is two thirds of the way up that cut of meat. Uh, so you actually have a dry side and a side that that's simmering and you throw it in the oven, you know, and it's lower temperature, not, you're not throwing it at like 350. You could do it at like 285, 300, depending on how slow you want to take it. And literally every 30 minutes or so, you check it, give it a turn, keep it working on both sides. And you basically just cook it until it's tender, depending on what the cut is. Sometimes that'll take 45 minutes. Sometimes that'll take three hours. Um, the beef shin, you know, that's going to take you a little bit longer. It's a real tough cut. Uh, but it pays off because you get, uh, you know, a lot of flavor in a really cheap, otherwise tough cut. I feel like the tougher the cut is, the more rich the flavor of the meat is going to be. Um, and uh, like I said, with a shin, you also get a little uh, marrow in there as like a bonus. So, and that's basically beef osobuco. Um, yeah. And then once that's done, if you really want to like fortify the flavors even more, you can take it out and actually finish it with another sear so that that four tender meat actually gets another kind of like crust and skin on it. And then you take that braising liquid and reduce it down and strain it out. And then, um, you know, once you have this really kind of like deep, rich, fortified sauce that you've kind of cooked down and cooked down, and like I said, you strain out all the bits and pieces and the bits of the carrots or whatever you have in there, and you're just left with a liquid and you can reduce that down. Um, and then if you want to get real extra fancy, you can even uh, take a couple knobs of butter and whisk it in at the very end. Uh, and that's going to give you that, that kind of rich velvety kind of textured sauce uh, that you can put right over that uh, beef shin that you just seared. And so it's like pork tender in the middle, crispy on the outside, and you get this really rich, deep sauce that can just slather right over the top of it. That's, you're, that's you're speaking my language. What's that? I said, you're speaking my language. This uh, slow cooking method is like my favorite way to cook for oh, yeah. a number of different reasons, but you know, you've, you've touched on basically all of them, but <laughs> incredible. We're going to have to have a meat mafia meet up and have that be the center dish. Right. I think that's what we're going to need. Oh yeah. I've never heard the beef shin. I, like this is uh this is something we're going to have to dive into. Yeah, it's 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 a cheap cut of meat. You can I, I see them around the stores too now. It's but uh, it's it's one of those cuts to me that it's 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 cheap. It's accessible. There's a lot of flavor there. Perfect for a braise. Like I said, you get a little marrow in there. It's a bonus. So yeah. to me, it, it's a go-to. I'll have to. I, it's funny. I have some in the freezer. I'll have to make it and do a little kind of like video, like a how-to slideshow for the shit. We it. need it. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. I'll put one of those together in the, in the in the next week or two. Beautiful. I think once, once I finally have my house on the market, I'll be able to like breathe a little bit. Yeah, gotta get that done. Fun things again. Yeah. I just had one more quick question because so Clemenza and I, just from a value perspective, we do make a ton of ground beef. Mm -hmm. It's tough to. I feel like it's really tough to keep that exciting. Do you have any recommendations on just things that we could be doing to? Just like spruce it up a little bit. Ah, there's a million things you could do with ground beef. I mean, even if it's you know making burgers, making meatloaf, making your own. I mean, once you if you're grinding your own, I mean, if you want to get really wild, you can start making sausages. Um, it, it, there's yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different things you can do. Um, another fun thing, honestly, is if you're if you're organ meat averse. Uh, one of the most like easy approachable ways to start incorporating things like liver is grind it into your ground beef. Mm. Uh, you're going to just make your, your ground beef more nutritionally dense, uh, get a lot more out of it. And it adds just a little extra layer of flavor, uh, to something that you might, you know, not be into otherwise. If you, you know, if you're not, you know, into liver and onions or pates or things like that, um, wow. That's definitely a, a quick and easy and approachable way to in, incorporate uh, something like liver into your ground beef. Mm. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit with ground beef. Like I said, there's, there's a lot of different things you can make. Something is loaf to, to, you know, making, uh, making your own sausages. Mm. 
Yeah, that's awesome advice. I, I'm I'm so simple with with the ground beef that I just I need to get to level two and three of just how to make it a little bit more exciting. Yeah, I mean, what, what do you guys normally do with ground? Like, when you say simple, what is what is what is simple? Like for car- like caramelize some onions and garlic and mix the ground beef in there and like maybe throw like some taco seasoning in or some cheese on yeah. top, something like something like that. Nothing nothing too crazy, but. Yeah, I know that there's like I like I never make meatloaf, but I love meatloaf. Like I should be just incorporating that, or sometimes I'll throw some red sauce into it and try and make like almost like my own bolognese without pasta. Um, but I'm finding, which sucks, my stomach is getting more sensitive to tomato sauce, which is terrible. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, it's just stuff in moderation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And honestly, if you're gonna make a bolognese, the the, the best best way to do it is is the longer you cook it, the better it gets. Mm. So, I feel like also if you're going to do that, you say you're sensitive to tomatoes, making sure you're using tomatoes that doesn't have uh, skins and seeds in it. You're just using the pulp itself yeah. and the cook it down. I feel like the more uh, approachable it'll be on your, on your gut. Got it. That's really let, good. Let it, let it cook away. Let it, you know, give it, give it plenty of time if you want to keep, keep rolling with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, I mean, you can even go, uh, uh, you know, if you want to kind of branch out a little bit with ground beef, you can start making, uh, um, satays. You can start making, um, uh, why I'm blanking on the term kofta. Uh, mm-hmm. you can even do, uh, Russian kotleti, which is very, very simple and basic. I mean, that's like super simple. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's that one, what's that one involved? It's literally, it's like, it's like making meatloaf, but then searing it. It's like making a, it's, it's pretty much what it is. Like it has a binder, um, okay. you know, traditionally with like breadcrumbs or something like that, but then you throw it in a pan and fry it essentially. So it's, 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 it's really, again, it's just trying to create some variety with ground beef. And, you know, if you're, if you're into getting, um, you know, like a quarter cow or a half cow from a local rancher, you're getting a decent amount of ground beef anyway. So you do want to, you, you have an opportunity to kind of play around and try new, new things, but yeah. yeah Pasta, balls, meatloaf. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of different things. Like you said, doing a good bolognese. It's, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of options out there. Speaking about the local rancher, are you, are you very passionate and just particular about how you source your meat and where you buy it from? Yes. And, uh, it's part of the reason why I'm locating is to get to a place where, um, local beef is more accessible. Um, and hopefully in due time, I'm, I'm working more closely with that end of, uh, the whole beef process, the closer I can get to, um, the rancher and the processing, uh, I feel like is more up my alley anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah. Um, I'm no, I'm big into that. The better you can, uh, source your beef locally, the better, you, you know, even getting on, you know, establishing a relationship with a, with a, with a rancher nearby, I think is, is a, is a huge deal. Um, especially moving forward. I mean, you can see in how society is almost, um, villainizing beef. Um, and, and I think it's the, the commercial, you know, the big four packers are going to be, um, almost like boxing the average person out and boxing small ranchers out. Um, I think it's going to be more and more important if you want to adhere to the, the carnivore lifestyle, if you want to, you know, get, I mean, you can just get higher quality beef. Mm. You know, you get at the stores is still, you know, heavily grain fed. Um, now, now granted most of the most commercial beef is technically grass fed, you know, first 85%, but, they're getting grain fed the rest of the way before slaughter. And that grain is usually not the greatest quality. It's got, it's going to have a lot of corn and soy in it. Uh, so that's going to change the, you know, the fat profile of the beef itself. So even from a health standpoint, I think it's worthwhile uh, to make local connections where you can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You just don't have that level of customization or autonomy that you do when you buy from a farmer. It's like, you might even buy something that you think is grass fed because it's on the label, but they're still feeding it, you know, corn or soy to, to fatten it up the last, you know, 60 or 90 days of the cow's yeah. life. Right? And it's kind of 
New Zealand or Australia and it's like you have no you have no agency in the in the in in, in your food mm -hmm. there's no there's no connection there's no local connection there's nothing that's, it's coming from halfway around the planet and you have no verification measures you don't you, yeah it says grass like you said it, it says grass fed but are you sure I, there's no way to prove it right this has been incredible I don't know about you guys. I feel like I'm going to have dreams all night about meat after this conversation. We got to do this like in the morning next time. Well, yeah. Well, welcome to every day of my existence. That's pretty much. <laughs> this is awesome. It's like these little things are just, they're so valuable. Even like, I feel like Clemenza and I, you know, we, we've cooked for a few years, but there's just still so much that we can be doing with meat alone to just spice it up, make it more exciting and just make it more sustainable and easy to stick to as a diet. Well, I hate to break it to you. The learning process never ends. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm, there's a million things that I don't know and I want to learn. And um, it's, you know, I, I, but that's, that to me just makes it more fun is, you know, you, you're never going to know everything about food. Um, and, but learning as much as you can is always, it's, it's always uh, rewarding. So yeah, it's, you know, and like I said, I'm, I'm nobody special. I'm I'm not Thomas Keller. I'm not you know Lennox Hasty or anything like that. Uh, I'm just I'm just a dude who went to culinary school, and you know and and stumbled upon the the, the whole carnivore uh, lifestyle. So it's it's fun to learn, and I, you know yeah, I try to keep learning where I can. Love it. What's the best way for people to connect with you? Is it your Twitter? My Twitter, as of now, I'm going to be trying to expand that sometime soon. Yeah, I'm just a Gourmet Caveman or at Gourmet Caveman on Twitter. That's it. I don't even remember if I'm the Gourmet Caveman or just Gourmet Caveman. I should probably look it up. Yeah, well, let's we'll see how on top of things I am right now. <laughs> we'll cut you some slack. You're selling your house. What's that? Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I've been flat out for a, for a little while now, so I got to. Oh yeah, I'm just at Gourmet Caveman. There we go. All right, at double. We'll, we'll but yeah, best way to uh, reach out and uh, yeah, man, you know, I'm I'm always open to people reaching out, whether it's DMs or or, or sending replies. If anyone's got questions or you know, I'm I'm always up. I'm always game for talking food, no matter with whom. So. We'll expect slots on how to keep bugging you for recipes and things. And we'll most certainly be funneling people towards you and we don't have the answers. Yeah, of course. Yeah. That's like I said, if I could talk food all day, I'm a happy guy. So <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much for coming on, man. Looking forward to doing a round two some point soon as well. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And, uh, it's, uh, it's been fun. Beautiful.